Come on, church, let's give Jesus praise in the house. 11.15 a.m. service. Come on, who's excited to be in the house of God today? Okay, a third of us have had our coffee. That's okay, that's okay. We're gonna believe the Holy Spirit's gonna make up for the rest. Hey, my name's Pastor John. I'm one of the staff members here at New Anthem Church. Uh, just wanna say welcome to you. And if uh, maybe you're a new guest, a returning visitor in the last couple of weeks, Man, we hope it feels like family and like home here. Uh, welcome to church. Uh, we believe that God made today and God made you for the day. Amen. And so, uh, man, we want to say welcome. If you are new, if you are a guest, man, check out our vision, our mission, our values uh, on our website. We exist to do ver uh, three very specific things. It's on our wall in the lobby uh, to uh, experience Jesus, equip people, and to empower the world. We believe when all of those things happen that we're a church that's on mission. And uh, that's a heartbeat. That's what we want to be as a church on mission. Uh, for years, I say this all the time, for years I just went to church and I had no clue why. I had no clue why the church exists. And so we want to be so crystal clear about what we feel like God has put us on this earth to do. And also what you're a part of when you're a part of this church, what you are actually partaking in, even if you just come as a visitor. So uh, man, if, if, if you're new, we want nothing from you, but we believe God has something for you today and then it's going to radically change your life. And then of course, we always want to, as always, welcome our online guests, our visitors, Everyone tuned in, watching by way of Facebook and YouTube. Welcome, welcome, welcome. And uh, for those of you that just, um, you know, the couch was just too comfortable, get to church next week. We want to see you here. Uh, we're going to send out a search party. Get your butt in church. Can I say that? I can say that. Right. It's fine. New building, new rules. Okay. We're so glad that you're here. If you have your Bibles, you could turn with me to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, and I don't want you to get nervous. If you know anything about the Bible, you know that Romans is a very intense book because Paul is a very intense person. He pulls no punches. He's very intense, which means uh, what? This message, there has to be a little bit intense. You know what I mean? Um, because when we, meet, when we find ourselves uh, reading and studying and expositing intense passages, the mistake that many churches make is they either hide those passages, preach around those package, pa passages, or omit those passages, but we stand on the full counsel of God, even the stuff that's hard to hear, amen? So Paul's intense, which means this message is going to be intense, but I promise you it's going to be awesome. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be really good, so I don't want you to be nervous. And um, uh, th this really intense book, in fact, uh, Romans 7, 8, and 9 uh, chapters are like the Mount Everest of just like theological depth. But there's parts of it that just seem like, if you've ever read like a Dr. Seuss book, we're like, what are we even talking about anymore? It's like, you know, uh, it it's just like we're going back and forth and up and down and sideways. And I don't even know like where the gospel is in any of this because he's just going all over the place. Um, but what I hope today by the power of the Holy Spirit is that we're going to demystify some of that, simplify in a way that it can really be applicable and honestly encouraging for you. And so if you were here last week, we were talking about the gospel of Jesus. The gospel means good news. But the big idea of what we talked about last week is that the good news of Jesus is only as good as we allow it to play out and manifest in our life. So for some of us, the good news of the gospel is only so good because of the faith that we put in Jesus and the power of the gospel in our life. And I wanna move into an idea today that I've, we've actually preached several times, and it's this idea that the good news of Jesus is only good news because the bad news exists. Can I tell you, if you're in a season of good news, if you're in a season of favor, like, man, it's easy to be a Christian right now, you're in a season of good. Can I tell you, that good only has value, that good in your life, that good news that you're experiencing and living is only good because the bad news exists. The power of the gospel and the good news of the gospel is only good because there's something on the flip side of it. And maybe you're here today and you're like, Pastor John, I'm not one of those people. Like, I don't need any bad news. I'm good. I'm good without bad news. And I understand what you're saying, but let me make a case for this, okay? There is a reason we ball our eyes out when we watch movies like The Notebook. Some of y'all are like, I've never cried watching that movie. Like, Pastor John, there's something wrong with you. There is something wrong. Even my wife doesn't cry at that movie. I'm just like bawling. She's like, really? Seriously? You know? And, but there's a reason. Okay, I cry watching The Notebook. Thank you. 
Kathy agrees with me. I'm kidding. I know that's, I, I'm total, that was a joke from last week. It's, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, anyways, there's a reason for that. There's a reason when we watch war movies, either historical or fictional, it stirs something inside of us. And the reason it stirs something inside of us and the re reason it stirs emotion inside of us is because there's something intrinsic inside of every single one of us that wants the good, but the good only matters if there's risk. So why I'm bawling watching all of these cheesy romantic movies is because there's a chance they might not get together, they might not find each other. There's a chance these men might not win the war that they're trying to win. The bad guys might win and that risk raises something within us, something triumphant within us. And so the good news is only valuable, I would argue, because of the bad news. And so things like good, things that are beautiful, things that are awesome, things that like victory and winning are only beautiful and only hold their value because things like bad, hate, loss, and losing exist. Are you with me? So today, there is a mental and soul level disposition that Jesus created you to thrive in, and I'm gonna tell you what it is. You ever watch a movie trailer, and as soon as you watch the movie trailer, you're like, I don't need to go watch the movie now. You literally told me the whole movie from the trailer. That's what I'm about to do. Okay, so here's where we're going. Here is the disposition that Jesus created you to walk in. Life and peace. Everyone say life. life. Everyone say peace. Now, peace is the end game. Peace is the end game. And if you're in this room today, New Anthem Hospital, it's because there's some area of your life like mine as your pastor, maybe multiple areas of your life like mine as your pastor that need more peace. Really, God, I need more peace in this. When I look at this part of my life, when I look at this part of my struggle, when I look at this kind of relationship, all I see is chaos. God, I need peace. And the Apostle Paul is going to give us a roadmap to ultimately find it. Life and peace. We're going to discover this together today. In other words, what we're going to discover as we read through this roadmap is about this mental soul level disposition. Less of me, less of us, more of God equals less death, more life, which leads to peace. Amen? We'll see you guys next week. I'm just kidding. Okay. <laughs> Romans chapter 8, verse 1, and then we'll jump in. It says this, Therefore, there is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit, the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by flesh could not do by sending his own son in likeness of sinful flesh for our sin. He condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law would be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For those who live according to their flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the spirit set their minds on the things of the spirit. For to set the minds on the things of the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is, say it with me, life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If, in fact, the spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. May God bless the reading of his word today. Let's bow our heads and petition the throne of God today. Father God, we come before you our hearts are wide open, our, our hearts are bowed before you, our minds stand at attention. And Holy Spirit, we invite you. You're here with us, but we invite you not just into this space, not just into our, our mind, or not just into uh, this room, but ultimately, God, into our hearts, our souls, our minds. We, what we want you to do is rearrange some things rearrange our way of thinking, our way of thinking about the world, our way of thinking about the Bible, our way of thinking about the life, our, our life, and give us a glimpse of who we are, not through our own distorted mindset of who we are, but God, who you say we are, what you see when you look at us. And then God, restore us anew that we could leave here as more whole and complete followers of you. In Jesus' name, everybody said, 
amen. The verse one of our text today is one of my favorite scriptures in all of holy writ. And I say that almost every week when I read a scripture. It's like, this is one of my favorite Bible verses. Let's just say it's like my top 50 favorite Bible verses, which doesn't narrow anything down. There is, therefore, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Now, it was nice for the Apostle Paul to write a scripture that if an unbeliever was to read this text, even today, in 2023, years and years and years later, to be encouraged that, man, if they just say yes to Jesus they will find life. That was nice of the Apostle Paul. He was actually nice for a change. (laughs) But what we discover when we look at the audience of who Paul was writing to was that this specific part of the text was never intended for unbelievers. It was intended for believers. Now, why is that significant? Because the Apostle Paul in verse one is starting with the assumption that for all time, all of humanity's history, they would always, always struggle with this idea that though I'm a Christian, though I'm a believer, maybe because I went back to an old behavior, maybe went because I went back to an old sin and an old way of doing life, I went back to the, an old mindset, I went back to an old person, an old relationship, maybe salvation didn't take. Maybe I'm not actually saved. Maybe, this all, maybe I just need to start the whole process over. Maybe I didn't fully accept God's love. And the Apostle Paul's encouragement to you in verse 1 is not for the unbeliever, but for the believer. There is no condemnation for you because you're in Jesus Christ. And there's one excited person about that. I thought there would be more. I really did. Two excited people. We're moving in the right direction. We're moving the needle, people. Listen, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Verse 2. For the law of the spirit of life, I love that, spirit of life. So it's not just like in the spirit or the Holy Spirit. No, spirit of life. By definition, the function of the spirit, life, bringing you into more abundant life. The spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. Okay, I'm going to ask a weird question. Have you ever been living your life and had an out-of-body experience where you were able to look at yourself as you were living, talking to someone in a relationship, being a husband, being a wife, being a mom, being a dad, whatever. And if you ever had an out-of-body experience where you're able to observe yourself and be like, that's, that's how I want to be. That's how I want to act. That's how I want to parent. Like, all the time. I wish I could be like that all the time. I love the way I am right now. Anybody? Okay, there was more people at 9 a.m. That's okay. You ever had this experience where... Where, man, yes, sure, there's a list of things like, man, I want to start doing this, I want to do this better, but right now, I'm not doing awful at being a husband. I'm not doing awful at being a wife. I'm not doing awful. And and, and with this this moment of encouragement that's oftentimes followed up by momentary sadness because you'll come out of that and you're like, oh, I've already missed it. I'm already back to my old way. We're already back to the same argument. I was, we were doing so well. I was doing so well. I was being so patient. In this moment, it was easy for me to be the best version of myself. And now here I am in the old version, in the old ways, with the old proclivities, the old sins, the old, oh, oh, my old struggles, my own level of impatience that I always seem to have. I don't know if that's been you. That's certainly been me. That's been my own frustration. And the Apostle Paul is pointing us to a truth about this that's, that's underneath, that's kind of hidden underneath the scripture. So we have the spirit of life. The spirit's about life. It set us free from the law of sin and death. Now, one theologian points out that happens at the moment of conversion. So this freedom that the spirit of life, because of Christ's work, is going to do in us to set us free happens at the moment of conversion, not someday after we're saved. See, some of us were wrestling with things and struggling with things because we have it in our minds. We got saved. We we became a Christian. I'm a follower of Jesus. And then some of the, now a lot of these struggles, a lot of these issues, a lot of these addictions that I have, man, hopefully someday God sets me free. But what if I told you 
that Christ's work that's afforded to you when you say yes to Jesus and you responded to the gospel set you free instantaneously. Opened the prison doors. Some of y'all haven't left yet, though. What if I told you there's a big God in heaven? He told you that, that the hell or prison that you feel like you're in, God Almighty already broke you out and he's already given you the keys. See, some of us, we just keep sticking around the prison. Some of us have believed the lie of the enemy that we are no more than our addiction. That we're no more than the weight of our past mistake or failure. And that, that, that's just who we are. That's, that's become our identity. So here Jesus is trying to revive and renew and establish our identity in him. And we are struggling, hanging out in our prison cell with the doors wide open. And Jesus on the outside saying, come, beloved. As the Spirit's whispering, bringing us, hey, I want to bring you into life. Life is out here. Life is outside the prison. Life is outside the shackles. Let me lead you into life. Verse 3, for God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. One of my favorite pastors, Steve Anderson, he says this, that the law is weak because it speaks to our flesh. Now, when I say law, we're talking about the Old Testament, before Jesus, the rules, the list of rules, right? It was weak because it spoke to our flesh. It, the, the, the law comes to, to fleshly men and women and speaks to them as fleshly men and women. So if you follow Jesus long enough, you begin to look at the Ten Commandments differently. When, you, when you're first checking out church, you're first reading your Bible, you're first discovering uh, about the Old Testament and New Testament, you read the Ten Commandments, and you're like, this just seems like a real bummer, like, list of rules. And then you go to church a little longer, and you're just like, okay, I'm doing pretty good. I don't feel like I'm breaking most of these. Like, some of these are really intense. Some of these I would never do in a million years. It's no big deal. But if you go to church long enough, you follow Jesus long enough, you actually hear, I'm to the point where I look at the Ten Commandments as a list of everything that's wrong with all of us. You know what I mean? We all break the Ten Commandments every single day. We do. Like some of y'all are like, Pastor John, I haven't made an idol today. So, boom, that's one. One, I'm good. Okay. Okay. So, let's, so it says, uh, do not make for yourself a graven image. But, but if you dive into that in Acts, uh, uh, Exodus uh, chapter 20, what it's actually talking about is recreating God or your faith to suit yourself. Right? So it's, it's not just like, well, I don't have these little idols built in my room that I worship, so I'm good. Yes, that was culturally what was going on. But there was a broader scope of that commandment, which, by the way, every single one of us do. When we know what the word of God says and we do the opposite, that's essentially what we're doing. And then remember, we can go back to the Sermon on the Mount. It's like, hey, hey, I haven't, I haven't murdered anybody. We're good. Check that off the list. Have you had anger in your heart? A unrepentant anger in your heart towards someone because God said, oh, same level, same level. Foot of the cross, that's the same, same level. And so all of us, it's a, it's a glimmering list. It's not something that should make us nervous. It should encourage us. It should be a, li li a list of things that as we read through, we're just like, okay, boom. Uh, yeah, that needs Jesus. Yep, uh, I need Jesus. I need Jesus. I need Jesus. We go through. I need Jesus. The, 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 the Ten Commandments should, should point us and push us to the foot of the cross in repentance. That's the purpose. This is what Jesus came to fulfill. It says, for God, what God has done for God has done what the law, weakened by flesh, could not do. Why? Because the law could only detect sin. Old Testament, the law could only detect sin. By the way, you ever meet people that are really good at that? Christians are the worst. You ever meet, meet a Christian who's like a professional sin detector, and they detect sin with everyone else except themselves? You know? I call them modern-day Pharisees. They're my favorite kind of people, and they don't last long in this church by the grace of God. Pointing out everyone else's shortcomings. One, when Jesus is the only one that can defeat sin because of his work on the cross. And so 
The law was weakened by flesh. What it could not do, here comes Jesus, is our hero. He fulfills the law. Verse 4, in order, this is so huge, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Now, I didn't get much crowd participation in 9 a.m. I'm really believing 1115 is going to be a little bit better. Okay, so you don't have to answer this first question. Let's figure out what is the righteous requirement. Okay, so... What is required to be righteous? Perfection. Perfection is what is required to be righteous. Okay, so let's reread this again, because we need to figure out, is Paul telling us to fulfill this? Verse four, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. So here's the question, crowd participation. Is Paul asking us to fulfill this, to fulfill perfection? Very good. Only one person in 9 a.m. was brave enough to answer, and they answered wrong. It was so funny. They were like, I was nervous. I'm like, now I see why. Anyways, you guys did so good. No. But we need to figure out why. And if we follow the systematic theology, Paul is, is starting from a position and a posture that he repeats all throughout his writings. And it's a position called the imputed righteousness of God. The imputed righteousness of God. This is what Paul is leaving out. He's, he's kind of looking towards the camera, tipping his cap, but he's not actually saying it. The imputed righteousness of Jesus. If Paul meant that we need to, to fulfill this, that it was our requirement to fulfill perfection, which we obviously could not do, he would have said it in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled by us. But instead he says in us, and he speaks from a tense like it's already been done. Why? Because this is what Jesus did. Jesus fulfilled the righteous requirement, perfection, so that now, when God looks to us, hey, there's the sin, guilty, we say, we're with Jesus. The word of God says we become hidden in Jesus. It, it, it covers us. His work at the cross, his blood that was shed, covers us. We become hidden in Christ because of his imputed righteousness, which means Jesus fulfilled it, and we fulfilled it, even though we didn't. <laughs> That's awesome. That is awesome. That is a picture of the imputed righteousness. Okay, I want, I want to give an example. It worked in, in 9 a.m. I wasn't planning on saying it. I wrestled with God. I told him I didn't want to say it, but now I'm going to. Have you ever played Super Mario Brothers? <laughs> okay. So here's a picture of, the, of, of imputed righteousness and the grace of God. So you remember, like, you're on the mushroom, you don't know the level that well. You got to jump to the next mushroom. You get a running start. You think your trajectory is perfect. And then what happens? You fall down. Ba -da -ba -ba -da -ba. Dead. But then the creators of the game, Jesus, made the game, fixed the game in such a way to give you what are called lives. Those wonderful green mushrooms. I call them grace. The Apostle Paul says, grace upon grace, grace upon grace upon grace. Unlike Nintendo, which by the way, I didn't under, n know, understood soteriology. Unlike Nintendo, we have unlimited grace. Well, how much grace? Well, how much grace do you need? Grace upon grace upon grace upon grace upon grace. It was the Apostle Paul who said himself, the things that I want to do, I don't do those things. And all the things that I just don't want to do, those things are that which I tend to do, O oh, wretched man I am. Can you relate to that? You feel that? You can relate to that? And yet Paul says, but grace upon grace upon grace upon grace. But hear me, that is not an allowance to live your life however you want to throwing grace out, which by the way, if you want to go back, we're not going to study the whole thing. You can go back to chapter six of Romans. The apostle Paul starts it that way because he assumed this is what the church was thinking. So he's like, yeah, okay, you don't understand grace. So he says this, six one, you can look at it for yourself. What then shall we say? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may abound? And then he says this, by no means, exclamation point. That is not what grace is for. Nice try. 
So he actually established that, and then we get to where we are in chapter 8, already established. So it's understood that we're not abusing grace. It's not an allowance of free wild card pass to be able to do whatever we want, and then if anyone tries to say anything, we're like, I'm under grace. God loves everybody. That's not, that's not what it is. But what grace allows us to do is be broken and imperfect and then struggle forward towards the cross. Stumble forward towards the cross. No one likes to preach life that way. We're running the race. Where we, some of us are stumbling forward, though. But as long as we're moving forward. So this, these next four verses, five through nine, they're significant. And there's three sets of two that I want to kind of simplify this because there's so much here. So there's two, two, and two. Everyone say two. And two, and two. So here's the first two. There's two mindsets in verse five. There's two destinies. And then there's two dispositions in verses seven through nine. Let's look at the mindsets first. Two mindsets. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on things of the flesh. But those who live according to the spirit set their minds on things of the spirit. Two mindsets. Now, so here's a real question. Where is your mind at, church? Because some of us are like, I know this answer. Pastor John wants to hear. Okay. The spirit. The spirit, Pastor John. No, that's the Sunday school answer. In every single one of us, I would say probably everyone in this room would, it, would at least desire to have a mind set on the things of the Spirit, and yet a desire for the, to have a mind set on the things of the Spirit is just the beginning. And that does not ensure that we will have a mind set on the things of the Spirit. Now, before you get offended, I want to show you someone who was really, really close to Jesus who had this exact proclivity, okay? Peter, our boy Peter, God bless him. He's in this situation. He's at this last meal, last few moments with Jesus, and Jesus is laying the truth on thick and heavy. Listen, I got to go away. I'm going to die, but it's going to be great. It's going to be awesome. You just have to trust me. And here's Peter's response. Um, no. Okay. Yeah. Remember, he was most likely a teenager, a little angsty, okay? Matthew 16, verse 22, he says this. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord. This shall never happen to you. Jesus said, turn to Peter and get behind me, Satan. Like, it's a really heavy-handed response. <laughs> you are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Okay, friends, it is possible to be a Christian, love Jesus, have really, really good intentions, and not be spirit-minded. So our prayer as followers of Jesus needs to be, God, search me, know me, find if there's any offensive way in me. And maybe to even go a step further and assume that when you go to the throne of God to pray this prayer, that you are significantly worse than you even think that you are. And I don't mean that in like a, like a put down kind of way, like, oh, you're off. I'm not talking about that. I'm saying start with a desperation plea, a desperate need. Like, God, I need you because there's things that I'm seeing that need to change, but then there's probably a million thing, other things that need to change that I can't even see yet. And so start with the idea that God is oh so holy and wants you to be holy. And then say, Holy Spirit, do a work in me. I, sur I surrender. I, I, get, I give this to you. You can have it. And so there are two mindsets. There are two destinies. Two destinies. Verse 6. For to set the mind on the flesh is death. That's a destiny. But to set the mind on the spirit is, say with me, life and peace. How sobering is it to know that the spirit of God present here with us in this room, the spirit of life, is this is the end game. This is the end of the story. In, in, in terms of our relationship with the Holy Spirit, life and peace. One theologian points out that this isn't just a general sense of peace. This is peace 
that you have with God, but also that God has with you. So let me share a very consistent and regular prayer that I pray a lot, way more than I would like to. God, please help me to be better tomorrow than I was today. God, please help me to not be an idiot to my wife like I was today. And the deep part of that prayer comes from a place that desires so greatly, like, like to, to an emotional level, desires to have God's work towards me and what God's putting towards me, all of the love and the joy and, and the, the grace and the favor for all of those things to eventually outweigh the discipline and the correction. That's my, that's my prayer. That's my dream. That, that God would look at me and rather than like, oh, there's, there's just all of these things that, I, that you just, I want, the, the, my dream is someday that he could look at me like when a parent is looking at a two-year-old sleeping. But like a, like a two-year-old that's going through the terrible twos, you know what I mean? But when they're sleeping, they're just, oh. Oh. that's my prayer. That's my prayer. Friends, there are two destinies for you. One is the flesh, and it leads to death. One is of the spirit, and it leads to life and leads to peace. So there's two destinies, and there are two dispositions. Verse 7 says this, For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. Whew! Does that word scare anybody else? Apostle Paul needs to dial it back a little bit. For it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. One theologian says this about verses 7 through 9, that this isn't so much for the Christian that is, feels like they're bad today, but rather for the unbeliever that feels like they're having a bad life. And so let's define this word hostile. If we go back to the original language, it would mean something along these lines, a hatred toward God, an enmity toward God, or a bitter oppression towards God, which means what? That those who are hostile toward God and aren't followers of Jesus, there is no neutral state. And what I mean by that, there is no neutral state. Those who are hostile to God, to God, according to the Apostle Paul, are those that are in active rebellion or passive indifference toward God. Active rebellion or passive indifference. And unfortunately, according to this truth of the gospel, hell will be full of both according to the word. Again, I didn't write it. I'm just standing on it. So this is the Apostle Paul's word to us, that there, there is more for us, that there is more for us. He's wanting it to be abundantly clear. It's, there is no lukewarm. The word of God, there's, there's either hot or cold. Those that are lukewarm, those that are kind of, I think, I'm, I don't know, Jesus is kind of cool. Like Lukewarm? The word of God says, I will spit those out of my mouth. There is hot and there is cold. There is hot and there is cold. Now, in the context of us, for us as believers, verses 7 and 8 is really significant because it means that both for the unbeliever and for the believer, we cannot put God in our debt by being good. Like, God, I was good. Like, New Anthem, they needed a lot of help. I served a lot to help them move into that building, so... Uh, by the way, it's a greater temptation as a pastor to do what I just said. God, I've been serving you forever. So, we're, we're show up. We're, and it's funny, the Holy Spirit shuts me up so fast. Like, so fast. I don't even get the words out. I, it's usually like a thought. And then it's just like, Gone. Like, I don't know if, like, the Holy Spirit like, ever told you to shut up. I don't know if he's told me to shut up. I've definitely felt like that, though, for sure. We can't put God in our debt. That's not what our good does. In fact, the good works we try to do, the Bible says, actually, those are, those are like filthy rags. It's about God. It's about his glory. It's about how ferocious he is for his glory. It's about the work on the cross done for you despite you and how we can be forever connected to the God of heaven. It's about the life 
that God is leading you into, one that's going to be rich and abundant and full of peace if you will allow that to be the life that God is drawing you into. Let's wrap things up with verse 9. It says this, You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. So this is, again, really, really strong language, but this is a defining line that Paul is being clear, and this should actually encourage encourage us. He flips it back. He goes back and forth talking about believer, unbeliever, believer, unbeliever, and then he says, listen, but y'all are Christians. You have the Spirit of God inside you. He's dwelling in you. And what he's building for us is a case for us to live our lives differently tomorrow than we are today. To go deeper and deeper with the Savior whose desire for us, according to the Spirit inside us, is to bring us into life and peace. What is your roadmap for peace today? Life with Jesus. What is your roadmap for peace today? Less of you, more of God. Peace for your life. Less of you, more of God. Peace for your life. Amen? Amen. Come on, let's bow our heads in this place as we close. I want you to just take a moment as the music plays, and I just want you to consider what areas of your life that you're needing God to to breathe some some life into. When I say that, what I mean is there is a mindset that God has been calling you to change. There is maybe a behavior, maybe a relationship, a proclivity. I don't know what it is for you. God does. He's bringing it to your mind right now. And there's this moment of surrender that can be absolutely transforming for you. And I just want you to take a moment and to just do business with God. He wants to lead you into life and peace. There is a a prison that you guys have maybe lived in, some of you have lived in, because you haven't realized the door is open. You haven't realized that you're no longer shackled to it. And the Holy Spirit's on the outside whispering, let me lead you into life. But you need to step out of it. You need to step away from it. You need to surrender it. You have to take some steps. For some of you, it's not so much what you need to stop doing, but for others, it's, it's what you need to start doing. How you need to start valuing your time or Maybe for you, you really are only even attempt to be a Christian on a Sunday morning, and maybe God's saying, no, 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 uh, it needs to be your whole life. It needs to be your Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday. I don't know what it is for you. Just do business with God right now. Just talk to him. He's listening. Feel free to even come forward and use the altar if you want to just talk to God. Some of our prayer team can certainly come forward and pray with you as well. But maybe you're here this morning and you've never formed a relationship with Jesus when you consider the hostility toward God. Your, for you, your issue has been you've never actually said yes to Jesus. You did, maybe you didn't understand that you couldn't be, you can't be indifferent. To be indifferent or an act of rebellion against God is an offense to the cross of Christ, Paul says. And so you can have a fresh start with Jesus You don't have to try to clean yourself up or get yourself right ahead of time. You can have a fresh start with him and say yes to him today. Here's here's what the Bible says. makes it really simple. 1 John says, if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you of your sins, to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And so you you can have a fresh start by confessing, I'm a sinner, I'm broken, I need Jesus. That prayer will start a relationship with Jesus. The Holy Spirit will take up residence inside you and then begin to change and transform you. This is what it means to be a Christian. It's very simple. Sometimes church is complicated. But if that's you today, you would say, that's me, Pastor John. I do. I want to walk with Jesus. I want a relationship with him. I want to surrender my life. All I'm going to ask you to do is on the count of three, just lift your hand in the air. 
Why? Because the Bible says, if you recognize me here on earth, I will recognize you before my Father in heaven. So do you want to walk with Jesus today? One, two, three, all over this room. Just lift your hand in the air. Anyone else? Awesome. Anyone else? I want to walk with Jesus. I want to surrender my life to him starting today. Fresh start. Awesome. Awesome. Fresh start. Fresh start. Awesome. 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 Well, let's pray this prayer out loud, church family, to support all those praying this prayer for the very first time. Say, dear Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. I repent of my sin. I turn away from my sin. Help me to live for you the best that I can. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Come on, let's celebrate with all those that made those first-time decisions. It's amazing. It's why we exist. A couple of things before we go today. Um, if that's you, you prayed that prayer, please let us know. Fill out a Connect card. You can check the box. Say yes to Jesus. We want to plug you in to our church. You weren't created to do life alone or to do faith alone. That's why the church exists. And so we'd love to plug you in and get you involved here at New Anthem Church. We have small groups starting very soon, so it's a great time to get uh, to jump in and get involved here. Um, another thing I want to get your uh, draw your attention to is again we're do uh, we don't have a date yet, but we are going to be uh, developing a date for our grand opening. So we want your uh, fuel behind that, your energy behind that. It's going to be a really really uh, important time in the life of our church. Uh, uh, and besides that, our prayer for you as a staff, as we pray for you every single Tuesday, is that the Lord would bless you and keep you, cause his face to shine upon you, turn his countenance towards you, be gracious to you, and give you peace. Why? Because the best is yet to come. We'll see you next week.